The Natural History Museum actively engages in conservation through the preservation of valuable ecosystems, reintroduction of native species, and protection of sensitive species. The translocation of the red-legged frog exemplifies that work and also speaks to the most unheard of international collaboration among numerous agencies. We're excited to share this story with you tonight. The 2019-2020 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor the Downing Family Foundation and media partner KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial counties. And we are thrilled to have Tom Carlo, the general manager of KPBS here tonight, who will introduce tonight's speakers. Tom, thank you for your support of the museum and uh, thank you for helping out tonight. Well, thank you very much, Judy. And I want to say a good evening to all of you and thank you for attending tonight's virtual NAT talk. You know, KPBS has supported NAT talks for several years as we feel it's our, our responsibility at KPBS to support organizations doing great work here in San Diego like the NAT. And these talks provide an important forum for topics related to science, history, conservation, and more. Tonight's talk is especially exciting because it focuses on a major milestone that happened here in San Diego County. And KPBS covered the story of the red leg frogs translocation earlier this spring by our science reporter, Shalina Chatlani. And this is just one example of our commitment to bringing important science news to viewers and listeners. Science is a big part of our programming and our journalism. And we have established what we like to call the Life Sciences Content Desk. And this desk covers stories related to science, technology, environment, and health. And this week, KPBS was honored to receive the Distinguished Coverage Award from the San Diego Society of Professional Journalists for our one week long series called San Diego's Climate Crisis, the Urgency of Addressing Human Causes of Climate Change. To amplify this issue, KPBS has launched a climate change desk to step up our coverage of this threat, including stories and interviews with experts and newsmakers. This coverage is in addition to the normal coverage we do with the environment, health science, and technology. And these are stories we know that you rely on and trust from KPBS. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's first speaker, Dr. Bradford Hollingsworth, has served as the curator of herpetology since 2000. He has had many roles at the NAD, including postdoctoral fellow, guest curator of exhibits, and expedition lead herpetologist and volunteer. Brad earned his doctorate from Loma Linda University and obtained both his MS and BS from San Diego State University. Brad's research focuses on the evolution and biogeography of the reptiles and amphibians of Baja California and its associated islands. He is also an adjunct professor at San Diego State University, where he regularly serves on graduate student committees in the biology department. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Brad Hollingsworth. Great, Tom. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight for our presentation um, on our frog, our frog project. Um, I'm Brad Hollingsworth and I'm joining in, joining me in a moment will be uh, Frank Santana. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on our work to bring the California red-legged frog back to Southern California. And any project like this um, involves a lot of people. Uh, this has been a binational conservation effort um, involve, involving an entire team of dedicated biologists um, we've been working on this project for more than a decade now, and needless to say, I won't bore you with all the permitting that it required to get this, this um, effort underway and accomplished. Our team involved the USGS, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the NAT, of course, um, help from uh, a smaller uh, conservation-minded groups like the Wildlife Project and the Sonoma Mountain Preservation Foundation, both located in Northern California. They helped us a whole bunch. 
And key to it all were our Mexican partners at Fano, which Judy mentioned, um, Annie and Jorge will be giving um, a Spanish language nat talk a week from today um, from their perspective. Every person on this team played a critical role and if not for any one of them, the effort would have come grinding to a halt. And um, if I was ever to think that a movie would be made of this, it would of course be an all-star cast of people. I point out some notables here out of this list of people like Clark Winchell, from the Carlsbad Office of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I always say he's clearly a George Clooney. Um, uh, Susan North, our, our, our go-getter organizer, kept everybody focused on um, the mission at hand uh, from the TNC. She easily played by none other than Meryl Streep. And I think Robert Downing Jr. could easily, if you ever, if you know Robert Fisher, Robert Downing Jr. would be a, a perfect stand-in for our own Robert Fisher from the USGS. And while everyone here on this list is um, on our team or my heroes, they're all inspirational to me. I think it's Annie Peralta from Fano. Here you see Annie and Jorge um, getting ready to go into one of our more remote locations down to La Grulla up in the Sierra San Pedro Martires. You see the the pack mule in the background, so it's all, all day hike to get down there. But Annie from Fano um, is clearly my biggest hero. Annie and Jorge run a uh, family owned conservation NGO in Ensenada. Both are my former students, and I'm the founding, um, I'm one of the founding board members of their organization. So I have deep ties um, with um, everything that they're trying to accomplish. If there is anything I can say about Annie herself is she's the kind of person who never says no. And so um, she's always up for the challenge. Um, so I, I think you should really pay attention to next week's Nat Talk. Um, it's gonna be in Spanish. Um, and so it's a Spanish language Nat Talk next week with Annie and Jorge presenting. Um, of course, this is a story within a story. Frogs have been suffering for the last two, uh, three to four decades. Um, and their plight is part of the global amphibian decline. There are lots of factors involved with frog declines. In the case of the California red-legged frog, we can certainly say that um, climate change, the introduction of non-native species, habitat destruction, the outbreak of a lethal fungal pathogen, all of these have contributed to their extirpation in many parts of their range. We estimate that they have been um, that they've been reduced in in their overall range. They've declined by about 80 percent. And where you still find them present, um, you often find them in low numbers. So on a map, it looks like yes, 80 percent reduction. But then when you go to the 20 percent that are remaining, um, those populations are even smaller than what historically had been reported. Um, this is a specimen from our museum collection. Um, we can say for certain that the last red-legged frog seen here in San Diego County was in 1974. Um, and this specimen from Baja, California is our last that was seen since 1978. And you'll um, be talking about how these specimens played a role in our efforts to relocate them down um, in Mexico. Now, if you focus on this distribution map in the center to start with, this is from a, a, a notable field guide, the um, Peterson series field guide. Uh, the red-legged frog is shown, um, the distribution of the red-legged frog is shown in red. And Stebbins um, did range contractions where historical ranges were in light blue. And so you can see the whole Southern California, Northern Baja California, part of the red-legged frog range has shrunk, as well as their range in the Southern Sierra Nevada and margins all the way around. Um, and so um, they've severely retracted and we thought they were extinct in Baja California. Now, this is where Annie and Jorge come in. Um, uh, Annie started her doctorate program in 2013. Um, and this time she selected something to study that was near and dear to her heart. She chose the California red-legged frog from Baja California um, to focus on her research. 
Um, her history with studying frogs dates back to 2006, though, and at that time, the USGS and the NAT had heard that there might be frogs in the remote mountain ranges of the Sierra San Pedro Motier. So back in 2006, we assembled an expedition to see for ourselves whether um, these stories were true. Um, and both Annie and Jorge came along as, um, as students on that expedition. Um, and they caught, here they are, this is the actual picture of um, right after they had caught their, the first frog of the expedition. And we rediscovered their presence down in Mexico in the Sierra San Pedro Martir at four separate locations during that trip. Now, for years and years, Annie, unbeknownst to me, secretly dreamt of frogs, all the while while she was studying lizards um, in her master's program at SDSU. Um, so when 2013 came along and she started her doctorate work, she finally found her, her calling, her, her, her passion, um, and assembled her own binational team. And you can see this map on the left. Um, uh, altogether, we explored um, 40 different locations throughout all of northwestern Baja California from 2013 to 2016 to search for more frogs. Um, and I think we calculated out once we covered um, hundreds of miles of, of hiking between the, the crews that were doing all these surveys. And this is sort of what one of these surveys looks like. Um, these surveys involve walking along the stream, stopping to find evidence of tadpoles or egg masses or um, froglets or frogs, whatever you come across, and then recording them and recording all the um, environmental parameters. Um, and so we explored um, every location reported in the museum collection records, as well as a number of spots that had suitable habitat for frogs. And in 2016, we began publishing our results. The outcome of this work, um, we had discovered that only 10 populations remained in Mexico. All but one suffered from extremely low numbers of individuals. And you'll see that, um, the 10 populations are on the map as green squares. And nine of the 10 green squares um, had fewer than 30 individuals. Um, and so um, most, uh, with just a handful of individuals remaining. And we constantly worried that our green squares would turn into red squares. It was a constant persistent worry like, okay, well, the next time we go back to resurvey this location, are we going to find the same five frogs that were there the first time? Um, and that was a constant worry. So um, after we did all this work, the question came up is, what do we do next? Um, along with a couple of other papers we published, I felt personally that our work was done. We reported in the science journals and it was a good news, bad news story. Yes, there was frogs that lived in Baja, California. They weren't extinct after all. That's the good news story of them. But the bad news is, is that they were isolated in only 10 small populations um, in the remote mountain ranges of the southern portion of their, their former range. And there weren't very many of them. Um, Annie went on to receive her doctorate and our research focused on getting out a couple more research papers uh, 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 the data that we collected during those years of surveys. Um, and I personally thought my job as a scientist was complete. Um, and for Annie though, I now in hindsight, I recognize it wasn't. <laughs> In 2018, she called me up and informed me that her and Jorge were going to form a conservation NGO to save the frogs. And, and this was going to be centered out of Ensenada. They asked me to serve as their president of their board. And as I mentioned previously, and he doesn't take no for an answer. So I had little choice in the matter. Um, she would just convince me otherwise. Um, and so for the first um, year and a half, I served as the board president and now I've rotated off and I'm an active board men member in FANO. Um, um, shortly thereafter, in August of 2018, Annie received funding from the National Geographic to restore frog habitat. I was thinking we were gonna go down and pull some toolies and clean up the shoreline and maybe dig a little bit deeper areas so they could breed. But Annie clearly had other ideas. As you can see here, Annie, with the help of biologists from our, our partners up in Northern California, as well as um, biologists within that, 
um, started building new breeding ponds at Rancho Melling location. And as you can see, she wasn't messing around. Um, she was building not just little ponds, but real big, big, gloriously beautiful frog ponds. Um, and over the course of one and a half years, we've watched these two ponds mature. Um, by the six month mark, red legged frogs had self colonized both of these ponds. By the one year mark, there was four frogs in one pond and five frogs in the other pond. And by January of this year, the frogs were breeding. Um, this inspired the museum to help out even more. Um, we built more ponds and last year we started um, uh, digging the new breeding habitat at a second um, uh, location in a different watershed to help with um, bringing the numbers of the frogs up. These newer ponds have also self-colonized by frogs. So thankfully, it's one of these cases when you build it, they will come. And so um, here's a, a calling male sitting in the water. Um, this is going to be a video. It's a male where when it calls, the idea is that females come down to the water. That's sort of how the mating systems of, of frog biology work. Um, uh, females did come down and um, everything's looking really good. So let's take a listen here. I'll play the video. Um, in the background, you'll hear um, the Pacific tree frog course, but I think you'll clearly hear um, uh, the red legged frog. And so that's um, what they look like when they call. They have these lateral vocal sacs. They're, we think that most of their call um, is actually resonating underwater. Um, and so it's not a very loud call in for the human ear to hear. But if you were to go underwater, it would be a very profound call. Let's see one more slide here. There we go. Um, so the ponds that we built um, produced eggs for the first time um, this past winter. Um, in fact, it was about, I think it was our, our first week of surveys in January, of late January of this year. Seems like a lifetime ago, huh? Um, and so the eggs, um, the way the frog biology works is eggs are laid in the water and then they hatch as tadpoles. Um, each egg mass has anywhere from one to 2,000 eggs in it. Um, so each breeding attempt has the potential of producing lots and lots of frogs. And so our, our focus on improving um, frog breeding habitat for this egg laying event um, could potentially take our numbers from five to 20 adult frogs and boost it up to 100 or 200 frogs in the, in the sites that we're restoring down in Baja, California. Uh, during this time, um, we had other plans afoot after all this habitat restoration was going on. Um, in other parts of California, um, biologists had been experimenting with the translocation of frog eggs um, to areas previously occupied this, by the species in the Santa Monica Mountains. They had gone ex locally extinct in the Santa Monica Mountains. And they were taking eggs from a population in Santa Barbara County and moving them to the site in, in the Santa Monica Mountains with pretty good success. So the eggs were hatching, tadpoles would metamorph out into froglets and adult frogs would be emerging. Um, but for the rest of Southern California, there was a distinctive problem. And that's because the frogs that used to live here in San Diego County and Orange County and in Riverside County, and a little to the north of that, are part of a different genetic group than the frogs to the north. And so um, we had the problem of, of that we couldn't just take frogs from Santa Barbara County and put them here in San Diego because it was clearly a different genetic group. When word got out about our work in Mexico, um, a binational the binational recovery team formed it with the goal of translocating egg masses from Mexico to the United States. So not only were we digging ponds and restoring habitat, but a whole separate um, side effort was going on to put into place a translocation mechanism of these eggs that were being produced in our new ponds and bring them in and um, bring them here to Riverside and San Diego counties. 
So the first thing we needed to do down in Mexico was to learn a whole bunch more about when and where frogs laid eggs. Um, we had really very little data on the timing of egg laying. Uh, we were focused more on where populations had individuals and not exactly when they were breeding. Um, if we were to harvest these eggs, like the plan um, for the translocation team had put forth, we would need to be um, assured that we could be able to find them with reasonable certainty before mobilizing the team. And so um, in order to um, figure out when and where frogs were laying their eggs, um, uh, uh, we had to conduct a whole, it was a three month surveys starting in January. And the effort was led by our own Diego Luna along with Benicio del Toro from Fano. Oh, I mean, of course, Frank Santana there on the left. I'm, I'm thinking of my movie version of the whole project um, and Jorge Valdez there on the right. Um, this led to the reintroduction that we're talking about today. Um, and so for 12 straight weeks, um, they diligently monitored re reproduction in the streams of the Sierra San Pedro Martir. And what they found was surprising. Um, it was informative and obviously it led to success. And there's um, no sense for me telling you that part of the story when I have Frank here to tell um, you for himself. So Frank is a conservation biologist that specializes in frogs. Um, we're very lucky to have him at the museum as our collection manager in herpetology. Um, and Frank will begin um, with um, the conservation concept of building resilience. So let me go ahead and switch over. He's going to run the presentation um, from um, his screen. Is that you, your screen, Frank, or is that my screen? I think it's mine now. Okay, so everybody, here's Frank. I'm gonna, um, I'll see you at the end, but um, I'm gonna mute and go off now and let Frank take over from here. So see you thanks in a little for the bit. Great, thanks for the great introduction, Brad, and thanks for setting me up with that um, really good story on the conservation work that we're doing. Um, before I get started again, I wanna just thank all of our partners, um, Fano Del Nueste, um, Annie Peralta, Jorge Valdez, and I would also like to thank uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS, um, the Nature Conservancy, and all of our um, collaborators at the NAT also. So as Brad was mentioning, I'm going to be focusing on how we're working to build resilience with the California red-legged frog populations down in Baja, California. And Resilience is really important for this population because as Brad mentioned, there's only um, 10 populations left in Baja and they're relatively small. They have maybe up to um, 20 to 30 adults in each population. So they're, they're, they're not really strong in terms of numbers. So we're working to improve the health and try to get as much recruitment as we can from these populations. So just to show you a little bit more detail on where we're working, as Brad mentioned, we did focus surveys for frog eggs um, this winter and spring. And we worked in at two sites um, for our egg surveys. And it's about a six hour drive from San Diego. You can see south of Ensenada with the map on the left with the two red bubbles. And the name of the sites were uh, Rancho Melling and Rancho El Portero are the two sites that we worked at. So here's a picture of the ranch site at Rancho Melling. This is our home base when we're doing work down there. And it's this really quaint eco lodge, um, very beautiful on the foothills of the Sierra San Pedro Martir Mountains. And as you can see, it's a very peaceful place to work. And the ranch also serves as our home base. So it's kind of our lab where we're doing our work. Uh, we set up a field station out there. We have all of our food and all of our equipment and gear. At night, we make a nice little simple dinner, try to stay warm in the cold winter weather. And here's an overview of both sites um, adjacent to each other. So Rancho Melling is at 2000 feet in elevation and El Portero is a lot, a significant amount higher. It's, one, it's at 3000 feet in elevation. And you can also see that they're in two different watersheds. So Rancho Melling is in one watershed 
and El Potro is in a different watershed. And we surveyed um, both of these sites for three months, once a week. So we surveyed uh, stream habitat and pond habitat at both sites um, focused on eggs. So here's a picture of us working in one of the ponds um, in the, at Rancho Melling. And you can see how much vegetation there is. So the aquatic vegetation really fills in really quickly. Um, and the frogs need the aquatic vegetation to attach their eggs to. But when it's so dense like this, it makes it really challenging to find um, frog eggs. So it's kind of like looking at, at a, for a needle in a haystack. And we have to be really careful that we're not stepping on the eggs also. So it, it takes a long time to comb through um, each of these cattails here and see if there's eggs attached to it or not. So this is one of the ponds. And then to contrast, this is uh, some of the stream habitat. So the ponds um, are different than the streams in that they're deeper. Uh, the streams tend to be more shallow. They have these deep pockets, but overall, they're a little bit more clear in terms of visibility. And the depth is a lot, um, lot lower on these ones. So there are two kind of general habitat types with the streams being adjacent to the pond habitat. So what do we look, what do we find when we're going on these surveys? You know, besides our target of frog eggs, we also find really cool and interesting animals like this blastomatid beetle. Um, we also find non-target amphibian species. So this is a California chorus frog here, not our target species, but really cool to see what's out there. And this is a Pacific chorus frog. We also find two striped garter snakes. So all of the diversity that we're seeing out here indicates that it's a really healthy ecosystem. So the garter snakes actually eat tadpoles and frogs and native fish, and they're pretty common out there actually. And then we also find Pacific pond, Western pond turtles, excuse me. Um, so all of this diversity is, is showcasing the health of the system. We don't, we haven't found any invasive species, bullfrogs or invasive trout or other fish um, in most of these areas, which is a good sign. And then of, for, of course we find California red-legged frogs. So these are adult frogs, typically during the day um, when we're searching for the eggs, we won't find adult frogs, but every once in a while we do find adults. The adults tend to be noc nocturnal, but we can find some adults every once in a while during our surveys. Uh, most commonly, you'll find juvenile red-legged frogs. But we haven't found any eggs yet, right? And all of the pictures I've shown you, um, we're really looking for eggs during these surveys. And so I want to take you guys on a journey of what it looks like when we're out surveying for eggs. So again, here's an overview of the sites that we're looking at. And I'm gonna switch over to a video so you guys can join me on a journey to find red-legged frog eggs. Okay, bear with me, okay. So here we are, we're heading out on a survey. You can see those red icons there. Those are historic sites where, where we'd found red-legged frogs in the past. We'd found five red-legged frog egg masses in the past, but this year we're really focused on finding eggs. So let's see what we can come up with. So get your boots on, get your sunscreen ready. We're going on a little adventure, surveying in the stream, looking for California red-legged frog eggs. All right, so we slowly go upstream, checking the channel. And those green icons, those are representing the frog eggs. So we're ready. There we go. We found five egg masses already. Heading upstream, let's see what else we can find. There's one of the sites where we found eggs in the past. And then those green icons are showing where we found a couple more eggs this winter and spring. Let's go a little bit more further upstream. 
there we go. We have a couple more egg masses. And as Brad was mentioning, uh, there is, we're learning a lot about all these egg masses. Every time we find an egg mass, we're going to be learning about where they're laying it, when they're laying it. So this is really important natural history information that's going to inform the conservation for the species. Okay, so that was Rancho El Portero at an elevation of 3,000 feet. Now we're going to move over down to 2,000 feet elevation into an adjacent watershed. So bear with me here. We're moving over to the, the second site, Rancho Melling. All right, here we go. Let's find some more frog eggs. Let's see what we can find. And again, we had only found a handful of eggs in past years, so we're really learning a lot by uh, what we find from these focused egg surveys. Okay, there's a handful of more frog eggs, seven frog eggs. And think about, let's, let's look at what's happening about where they are. Are they in the stream? Or are they in a pond? And those ones were actually found in a pond. Frank, I'm going to interrupt because I'm not seeing the video. No one's seeing it? Mm -mm. Uh-oh. You want to try running Sharing this? Is paused. Sorry. Okay, just a second. Let me, uh, let me stop. We could try running this again. Share screen. What about now? I'm going to find eggs. This looks better. Okay, let's start the tour over. Is it, is it working? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Okay, so let's, let's go on this journey again. Um, you can see the red icons now. Those are where we found eggs in the past. So we're going to go, um, this is at Rancho El Portero at 3,000 feet elevation looking for some frog eggs. So let's head up the stream and you can see the stream channel is there because it's the one with, um, you can see the pattern of all the riparian corridor with the trees and everything. And there we have five egg masses. And as we head upstream a little bit, There's a site where we found egg masses in the past. And there's two more egg masses there with the green icons that we found in the past, found this year. And as you head upstream, we got two more egg masses now. Okay, so you can kind of see the overview here at this site. We found a total of nine egg masses and they're kind of spread out along the, the stream corridor. And now we're heading to the second site, which is at lower elevation of about 2,000 feet. All right, we're heading down to the second stream now. We're going to head up and see if we can find some more frog eggs. So you can see the stream at this site is actually a little bit smaller. There's not as much riparian vegetation. So the two sites are pretty different from each other in terms of the, the physical characteristics there. And then you can see up on the top there, there's a cluster of seven eggs and those ones are actually laid at a pond habitat. So these are cattle ponds that have been um, restored to improve their depth and remove a lot of vegetation. And we'll head upstream and see if we can find some more eggs. There's the ranch houses on the left there. And as you head upstream, There, we found three more egg masses right there, and those ones were laid in the stream. And there's a cluster of eight more there on the top, and those ones were laid in the Fano ponds. Those are the new ponds that Brad showed a video of being constructed earlier. Here's a quick overview again. 
showing the distribution of the, the two sites. All right. Let me uh, stop that real quick and we'll jump over back to the presentation. Bear with me for one second. Okay. So that was the overview of what we found. And I want to show you now so you guys can enjoy the beauty of these egg masses that we found. We found a total of 29 egg masses and every time we found an egg mass, it's a treasure trove of information that we're gaining about how deep the eggs are um, deposited, where they're deposited. So this is what the eggs look like from underwater. They're really, really amazing. They're about the size of uh, maybe a large grapefruit full of um, from anywhere from uh, 1,000 to a few thousand eggs, depending on the female. And you can see that we find them in all different stages of development. So these eggs are a little bit further in development. You can see that the, the dark spot in the center there is um, the embryo developing. So you can see that it's not a round mass anymore. And that's indicating that it's not, it, that it's actually fertile, that it's developing and it's, it's doing well. And all that debris on it is just kind of, um, you know, uh, debris from stream, the stream and the water flow. And then you can see further along, this is um, some tadpoles that have just started hatching out. There's a few of them still in the egg masses. And then you can see some that are attached to the actual outside of the eggs and the gelatin. And they hang out and they'll eat the vegetation or eat the algae that grows on the egg masses. So there they are and they're developing. And they seem like they're doing really good. Um, they're very, very small when they first start hatching out. So we have to be really, really careful when we're doing these surveys. Okay, so that's, uh, we guys, we went on a journey and we found some eggs, total of 29. Let's think again about where these eggs were in each of these systems. So this is the overview map for Rancho Melling. And again, we found a total of 20 eggs at Rancho Melling. 16 of those eggs were found in the pond and four were found in the stream. So that blue highlight there is showing the four that were found in the stream. Now let's look at the second site at Rancho El Portrero. A total of nine egg masses were found, those green icons, with seven of them being found in the stream and two in the pond. So there's a difference here at Rancho El Portero, the majority of eggs were laid in the stream and only a couple were in the pond versus at Rancho Melling, the majority of them were laid in the pond. So I keep bringing up this difference between the stream and the pond. And I want us to kind of reflect on uh, why there's, what the difference is between those, what that means for those egg masses, whether they're laid in a stream or a pond. So let's follow um, one particular egg mass and see what, what happened over time after it was uh, laid. So the idea of resilience relates to this difference between stream and pond. And the question that we're asking is, is there a different survival outcome for stream versus pond eggs? So let's see what happens with one of these egg masses. So this egg mass was laid on March 4th, 2020. And you can see that it was laid in a, in a stream habitat. It's relatively shallow. And you can see a little close up, hopefully you guys can see the egg mass there in the bottom of that picture. So the eggs were laid in the stream at a water depth of 22 inches. So that's pretty shallow, right? 22 inches is not, not providing great depth for um, an egg mass that pretty much fills that whole depth of 22 inches. And this one was approximately 500 eggs. And you can see the egg mass there. So we went and surveyed all these egg masses week after week after week. So if we found an egg mass, we would mark it with the flag, um, take data on it, how deep it was, the size of the egg mass, where it was laid, um, 
And then we came back the next week to monitor and see, make sure the eggs were developing well. This was a really fresh egg mass. If you look at the mass, they're all kind of circular um, globs in the middle, showing that they hadn't started developing very far yet. Um, so we were excited to come back the next week and survey for the eggs again. But unfortunately, we saw this when we came back. So we were, you know, we're happy for the rain. We really need all that rainfall out there. But this is a real torrent. So this kind of heavy rain event uh, resulted in those eggs, unfortunately, being washed away, right? So eggs in the stream are more susceptible to things like um, extreme rain events that will wash the eggs downstream. And that results in a reproductive failure for the frogs. So this egg mass, with all the work that um, the male and female put in uh, to produce that egg mass and fertilize it, and the male had to call and the female had to come um, and deposit her eggs, it was washed down into the ocean, essentially. Um, another risk of laying eggs in streams is that um, in a dry year, the stream could dry up. That was a pretty shallow depth there. Um, so that's where the ponds come in, in terms of resilience. So by building these ponds and maintaining these cattle ponds, um, we can reduce the extreme rain events that will flow. So these ponds are not connected to the mainstream channel. They're pretty far adjacent to it. So when a big storm like that comes through, it wouldn't wash any eggs that were in the pond away. And so we recognize the importance of ponds. And at the second site at El Portrero in November 2019, um, we were kind of ahead of the game and we had started building some ponds. Um, this is our uh, friend Rolando, a local rancher. So whenever we're doing this conservation work, we try as much as possible to work with uh, local ranchers and um, you know, lodge owners to, to get their buy-in to help us with these conservation projects. So he was maintaining this really old um, tractor. It ran beautifully. He dedicated a lot of time. He drove eight miles down a windy dirt. Um, or eight hours down a windy road um, to deliver this tractor to us so that he could build a pond. And this is what the pond looks like. So it's, it's not as elegant as the, um, the Fano ponds where we had a lot more heavy equipment, but we were able to, to dig out um, a patch you know, pretty far from the mainstream channel so that it would um, not have to be washed out. This is what it looks like in January 2020. So it's not suitable habitat in this photo for California red-legged frogs, but we're expecting that over time, just like the, the Fano ponds. This is a picture of one of the Fano ponds, that it'll fill in with native vegetation and provide really good habitat for the California red-legged frogs that we have down there. So we're, we're hoping to build resilience through this, these um, habitat restoration efforts so that things like the egg washing downstream and drought are not as much of a risk for these frogs. And we, we dig the ponds below the water table level so that they're relatively deep compared to the streams and ponds that are natural. Okay, so that was kind of the topic on building resilience. Now we're gonna jump into the reintroduction effort. As Brad mentioned earlier, um, a big part of our egg surveys was to um, plan for the reintroduction effort of frogs from Baja California to Southern California. So again, as Brad mentioned in the beginning, in San Diego, it's been over 40 years since California red-legged frogs have been seen. And in Riverside County, it's been uh, close to 20 years since frogs have been seen there. Um, and there's, a multi there's many factors that have led to that decline. Habitat loss, invasive species is a big problem like bullfrogs and things like that, which will eat the California red-legged frogs. Um, so we've addressed a lot of these problems at the reintroduction sites to make sure that they're suitable habitat for the uh, reintroduced frogs. So because we found so many eggs and because Annie and Jorge worked really hard on the permitting, um, we were able to get permits and permission to actually move eggs from Baja California um, back to those two sites in Southern California. So you can see this is one of the lucky egg masses that we um, were able to find um, after we had got all our permits in order and everything was ready. Um, we were real excited to find this egg mass just in the nick of time uh, so that we could translate it to the, um, the two sites in Southern California. 
So our initial plan was to um, collect these eggs. So we went out the day before after we identi identified the eggs and the day before the translocation was planned, we moved the eggs into this mesh holding bag. And this mesh bag is gonna hold the eggs so that we can monitor them and have them ready to go um, early the next morning. So after we collected the eggs, we put them in these bags in this temporary holding pin um, so that we'd be ready to go early in the morning um, for a plane flight from Ensenada to uh, Ramona so that we could uh, do the translocation. But unfortunately, there was a, a, an unfortunate series of events that really prevented that from happening. First was um, uh, a series of storms that prevented the plane flight from ever happening. So we had to cancel the plane flight um, and we had to make some last minute decisions about whether we were gonna be able to move the eggs from, um, from Baja to Southern California. And the reason why we were worried is that we wanna minimize the translocation time during uh, while we're moving the eggs. So we decided to go ahead with the, the move but we um, ended up using a vehicle to drive the, the eggs across the border instead. So um, we made some last minute plans, made some changes, and we were ready to go the next day. And here's a photo of Brad preparing the eggs in their plastic Tupperware container. And uh, we put them in these very insulated Yeti coolers. And if any of you have ever looked at the price tag on a Yeti cooler, you know they're very expensive. We actually had Yeti donate all the coolers that we used for the translocation, so that was pretty cool. Um, and you can see there's a bubbler attached to the cooler so that there's oxygen provided, and we had thermometers to make sure that they were temperature controlled the whole time. So once we had the eggs ready, this is um, Annie Peralta double checking the conditions of the egg masses before we um, head over and across the border. And you can see she has all the paperwork in order, so we're ready to go. We have all the protocols ready, and we can continue on our journey to the United States. So we finally made it after, um, after a couple of scares. COVID was just starting to happen at this time, so we were uncertain about whether the border was gonna be open. There was all these rumors about the border possibly being closed during this time. And the border waits were unusually long. We crossed in Tecate, and I actually waited for about two hours to cross the Tecate. Um, so it was a very long time, just kind of sitting, kind of anxiously checking the thermometers, making sure the frog eggs were good. And luckily they were, they were in perfect condition when we made it across. And this is um, at the, uh, this is the first reintroduction site, which is in Riverside County. County. This is the Santa Rosa Plateau Ecological Reserve which is managed by the Nature Conservancy. Um, and so that's the first site that was in Riverside County where we introduced the eggs. And you can see our partners, the USGS, are so excited to finally have the eggs back in Riverside after nearly 20 years. So here's Liz from the USGS um, using her little floaty to get the eggs into this um, temporary holding pen. So we kept the eggs in a temporary holding pen so that we could really monitor them closely. And you could see how far away it is from the shore. And that's to kind of keep people from tampering it if they, if they were curious about it. We didn't want people messing with the eggs. So that was the first site. And then this is the second site, which is a private ranch in San Diego County. Um, beautiful oak woodland habitat. Um, and the property owners here have done a lot to restore um, the habitat there. So they've removed, they've worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. Geological Survey to remove invasive species. There was a lot of bullfrogs that were removed, invasive, invasive fish were removed, um, and we've been doing a lot of work to restore. So this is what it looks like inside the cooler. You can see Brad's daughters um, left a couple uh, lucky charms in there, sending their love, they have a good luck note for the frogs um, and kept a couple stuffed animals in there for good luck. And I think it worked. And you can see here's the, the second site in San Diego where the eggs are getting ready to get moved in. And you can see how beautiful this habitat is. It's this large, um, large pond there um, with the, all the, the habitat requirements that these frogs need. And there's been a lot of restoration work. You can see on the bank in the back where there's a lot of native 
vegetation being stored there. And here we are celebrating um, the milestone of getting the frogs back in the water um, after many, many years of them being absent. So celebrating this initial milestone, but of course we don't wanna just leave the eggs there and then leave them to fend for themselves. We wanna come and monitor and make sure they're doing well. So the USGS went out every week to monitor the development of the eggs. And you can see in the left picture here, that this is the initial development of the eggs. They're starting to take that shape that looks more like a small fish. And then in the middle, they're growing and they seem like they're doing pretty well. And then the picture on the right, we have a whole lot of tadpoles there. And we actually were able to do a second reintroduction in April, despite COVID, we were able to squeeze in one second uh, egg mass and add some more tadpoles to the site. We're still learning a lot about uh, the health and the best way to, to hold these um, tadpoles in these cages. Uh, we had some mortality, but overall it's been a success. And we've had 500 um, tadpoles released at this site in San Diego. And for the first time uh, last week, we went out for a survey to look for the frogs after um, they were released in March and April, and it'd been a few months now August, this is just last week that the USGS went out on their first survey to see how the frogs were doing, to see if any of the tadpoles metamorphosed into frogs. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a frog in this photo. So hot off the presses. I'll give you guys a minute to try to find this California red-legged frog. All right, give you guys a couple more seconds. Can you find the frog? There it is. There's a California red-legged frog that is, has survived from tadpole to small frog. Um, and so this is really exciting news. This is just last week that we verified some survival. Here's a more close-up picture. So our strategies worked. It's definitely not, uh, we're not done with this work because we need to continue uh, translocating um, tadpoles or, or eggs and frogs, any life stages that we kind of think are our best so that we can get a population established um, and return these frogs to Southern California. And again, none of this would happen without the amazing work that um, you know, Fano has done in Baja California. And so the, the population in Baja California is, is really important, right? It's the source population. And so we're working to make sure that we protect both of these populations. And so we're actually working in the, to continue working at this site and likely reduce, uh, reintroduce more frogs in the future, possibly more eggs, maybe more uh, small frogs and tadpoles. But we're gonna continue with our reintroduction efforts in the future. So again, I'd like to thank all of our partners, Fano in Baja California, USGS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the San Diego Natural History Museum, all of our volunteers, the museum, and our co-workers, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Wildlife Project, and the Sonoma Mountain Preservation Foundation. And I would also like to acknowledge our donors, so um, International Community Foundation, GG Foundation, UC Mexis, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Geographic Society, Evolutionary Venture Fund um, from the Natural History Museum, uh, the Wilson family, Jay Savage and Rebecca Papendick for also supporting our projects. And of course, all of our contributors listed down there for all your help. And of course, thank you for uh, listening in and supporting our work. And with that, I think we'll open it up for questions. Well, thank you, Frank and Brad. Brad, are you going to turn your camera and microphone on and join us for Q&A? Yes, I am. Great. Thanks. Welcome back. We have a ton of questions, so I'm just going to jump in and skip the ones I had prepared in advance. Uh, first one is from Ryan. Uh, he wanted to know if it's easy to differen differentiate the red-legged frog eggs from other frog or toad egg masses from the rivers. So the red-legged frogs, have larger eggs than all the other amphibian species out there. So they're really easy to distinguish. Um, they're big. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're a lot bigger, um, 
clusters. And toad eggs are a lot more like kind of a stringy kind of um, long line. So they're very distinct compared to the toad species that are out there. Yeah, a little bigger than a grapefruit for the total size of the egg mass. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, quite a substantial site when you see them. They're really exciting. And then the eggs themselves are also quite large compared to like a, a tree frog or, um, um, or other things that lay it in a mass. Toads lay it in a string, so they're really easy to tell from a toad. Thanks. So Peter asked whether the artificial ponds were filled naturally by rain or by runoff. So, hi, Peter. Um, good to hear from you. Uh, Peter shows up for all of our events. I know Peter really well. <laughs> Um, they, they fill from groundwater, so all the, the artificial ponds are built in um, the 100-year floodplain of, of these, these watersheds. And so we just dig down and then they, when the tractor starts hitting um, uh, the wet spots, then we know that's about where we stop digging. And then the pressure that we release by removing that topsoil from um, the pond with the tractor um, allows the water to even rise up even higher. The pressure isn't so great on the water table. So the hydrology dynamics is something that we were learning all along the way. And thank goodness we had Jeff Alvarez from the Wildlife Project who's been building um, dozens and dozens of ponds in Northern California. And so when he joined our team, um, it really improved our abilities to locate good sites for ponds and, um, and then what to expect when we start digging. Here's a, a fun question from Tom. Uh, could the red-legged frog become as widespread as, as the Pacific tree frog? And you, guys, you guys are hopefully going to be terribly successful. What do you think? <laughs> I'm hoping, but uh, their, their habitat requirements are a little bit different. They're not as much of a generalist, so they kind of require these deeper pools of water and uh, the chorus or tree frogs can breed in things like an overturned flower pot. So they're not as... Um, resilient in that sense. They need deeper pools of water and more specific um, habitat requirements. So we're hoping to increase them, but I don't think it would ever get um, to that large of a population. So um, Stacy was asking if the water temperature differed between the pond and the stream egg laying sites. Oh yes, it did. <laughs> So um, I think it was 15 degrees Celsius at the pond, and I think the ones here in San Diego were more like 10 degrees Celsius. And so um, what we did was we, we graduated, while they were in those Yeti coolers, we put um, just enough ice packs. And so this is something that um, the USGS developed and experimented with. So they told us exactly how many ice packs to put in in order to bring the temperature from 15 down to 10. So by the time they got to the release sites, they were already acclimated to the temperature of the, the, of the release pond. So really, really fascinating how you just throw one more ice pack in and it gets two degrees cooler or take one ice pack out and the temperature rises one, one or two degrees. It was a little bit nerve wracking during the drive because I would pull over it every half an hour to get out and check on the, the temperatures. So I'm um, kind of like just pulling off on the side of a random spot in the highway in, in Mexico and um, checking on the temperatures, but those coolers really maintain the temperatures really stably. And it was a nail biter up at the, I was at the ranch site and we mm -hmm. thought you'd be there at 1030 in the morning and then 1130. <laughs> I think finally it was 430 in the afternoon. Yeah, it was almost dark. It yeah. was a long day. Yeah. <laughs> A long wait at the border, everything took longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ian writes, uh, wants to know if you see the egg masses attached to any specific plant species that's when you collected them. Yeah, that's a really good question. So we're still learning a lot about um, the preferences for what kind of vegetation, but it's, it was kind of really broad. It wasn't one specific plant species. Um, there was multiple species depending on where they were, that they were um, multiple plant species that they were attaching the egg masses to. In the ponds, there's a dominant species, which is the cattails, and they typically use that, but they weren't always using cattails, so it varies. Okay, so, and RC is, uh, writes that uh, mountain yellow-legged frogs are being bred in captivity in zoos. Is there, are there any plans to try this with red-legged frogs? 
we, we, as a group, we were trying to get away from uh, uh, heavy infrastructure because we're bring, bringing these animals from Mexico and um, we wanted to have um, a, a more direct result instead of investing on all of our, our little bit of money that we had to work with to build the infrastructure to raising them in captivity, a head starting them in captivity. And so that, that effort that people were doing in Santa Barbara down in the Santa Monica Mountains showed us that um, the direct egg transfer and release um, had, had lots of success. So we could cut out the, the middle portion that they, they're doing with the mountain yellow-legged frog. Mountain yellow-legged frog is much harder though, um, much, much more, a lot of requirements to you know, bring those animals back. 